Please take your seats. Our program will begin momentarily. As a courtesy to those around you, please silence your mobile device.
Please welcome trustee, program chair of the 2023 Parliament of the World's Religions, chair of the Women's Task Force, a Wiccan priestess, attorney and author, Phyllis Curon. With these spotlights, it's hard to see you, but I know there are thousands of you out there. Welcome. It is truly my honor and my joy to welcome all of you to the Women's Assembly of the 2023 Parliament of the World's Religions. It is wonderful to be back with all of you. Today we convene with a call to conscience defending freedom and human rights, gathering from across the globe, from diverse faiths and backgrounds, but united in our commitment to women's wisdom, women's spirit, and women's freedom. I stand before you today with a profound sense of urgency and determination to address a pressing issue that threatens the very fabric of humanity the growing threat of global authoritarianism and its disproportionate impact on women and girls. In 2009, President Carter addressed the parliament and he declared that discrimination against women and girls is the most pervasive and unaddressed human rights violation in the world. Today, just as we thought it was getting better, now, everywhere we turn, we are facing restrictions on every aspect of our lives. The United States Supreme Court's decision in Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization is a profound blow to women's personal health, to our reproductive rights and bodily autonomy, to our personal freedom. It sent shockwaves throughout the world, imposing one religious view on those who don't share those views. Theocracy is authoritarianism dressed up in religious robes. It once again imprisons the women of, Af Af the women of Afghanistan who can't go to school, to work, can't leave the house without the threat of violence and death. Iranian women and girls are subjected to one of the strictest forms of state-imposed gender discrimination in the world. But they pulled off their headscarves and they danced in the streets. They have faced beatings and poisoning and jail and death. And they have refused to be silenced. Their fortitude is a beacon of hope to all of us. In 2015, the parliament adopted the Declaration for the Dignity and Human Rights of Women reiterating the elders' call to conscience. The justification of discrimination against women and girls on grounds of religion or tradition as if it were prescribed by a higher authority is unacceptable. We changed the moral compass and now we must change the world. From Asia to Africa, from Americas to Europe, women are breaking barriers. We're challenging norms and we're shattering stereotypes. The strength of our collective voices is a testament to the unwavering spirit of the human soul, of women's souls yearning for liberty and equality. Our presence here today is a testament to the strength of our collective voice and our unwavering dedication to the cause of women's freedom dignity, and human rights. The values at the heart of our diverse faiths, compassion, justice, love, bind us together in this cause. We are women who share a common thread of grace that surpasses our differences. We carry the hopes of millions of women worldwide who look to us to remember their plight and their bravery let us use our platforms to amplify their voices, to uplift their stories, and break the chains that bind them, that bind us. Together, we can create a world where every woman's right to live with dignity, with freedom, and human rights, to live in the full measure 
of her spirit is honored and protected. Thank you. And now it's my pleasure to introduce you to the rest of the Women's Task Force. The staff, the volunteers, all work together for more than a year, meeting every week tirelessly to lift women's voices and spirits at the parliament. Together, we're going to share the declaration with you. If you'll come out, I think you're back there. <laughs> Ann Smith, Pat Farrow, Sharon Singh, if she's with us, I hope. Kekishan Basu, Sandy Hart, Miriam Belinsky, and watching us from home, Dolly Daster. I begin with the problem, always. Hey, she's the other. Excellent. All right. That's Miriam without whom nothing. The problem, the struggle for the dignity and equal rights of women is the global human and civil right. Let me begin again, I'm sorry. The struggle for the dignity and equal rights of women is the global human and civil rights struggle of our time. War and violence, economic disparity and impoverishment, environmental damage and its devastating consequences fall disproportionately upon women and girls who also suffer the most prevalent injustices in our world today. Violence, child marriage, slavery and forced prostitution, rape and sexual assault, domestic brutality and abuse, honor killings and immolation, bodily and genital mutilation, gender side of girls and selective abortion of female fetuses, and legitimized murder of women are pandemic. This is you. Throughout the world, one in three women have been raped, beaten, or violently assaulted. 700 million women were children when they were married. More than 133 million girls and women have experienced some form of genital, female genital mutilation known as FGM. More than 20,000 women a year are victims of honor killings, usually murdered by their father, uncle, or brother. Institutions in which women are given little or no voice impose constraints on women's basic freedom to control their own bodies, move about freely, own property, choose to marry or obtain a divorce, retain custody of their children, receive an education, work or have their testimony given equal right, weight in court. All over the world, they risk being ostracized, abused, or killed if they try to make these chains to change these unjust conditions. Nobody's reading. Even where advances toward equality have been made, William con women continue to suffer disproportionately from poverty and environmental devastation, from violence and abuse, life damaging discrimination in access to education and health care, the burdens of unpaid caregiving and unequal pay, and the systematic exclusion from decision making within religious and other institutions that determine the quality of our lives. These shameful violations of women's dignity and human rights are based on the false premise that men and boys are superior to women and girls, an outdated view perpetuated by too many religious leaders and adherents who choose to misinterpret or use carefully selected scriptures, texts, and teachings to proclaim the inferiority of women and girls. These harmful and religiously justified beliefs permeate societies and contribute to the pervasive 
deprivations and abuse suffered by women and girls throughout the world. As the elders have advised, the justification of discrimination against women and girls on grounds of religion or tradition, as if it were prescribed by a higher authority, is unacceptable. It is time to end these practices and views. It is time to heal the broken heart of humanity's feminine half. Being treated unjustly and with respect should not depend on whether one is male or female. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the Declaration Toward a Global Ethic call for the equal rights of men and women and the teachings of the world religion's universal call for compassionate and equitable treatment of all, both women and men. The principle of treating others the same way one wishes to be treated is stated in one form or another throughout the religions of the world. We are all interconnected and interdependent. And when half the humanity of race suffers, we all suffer. We must all be treated with justice, respect, kindness, and love. It is impossible to imagine a God, a divine source, a sacred and ultimate reality that is unjust. There is no religion that despises women, for hatred and oppression cannot come from the heart of God, or Godness, or Holy Father, Mother, nor flow from that which is divine, the Creator, the One, the Source, the All. It is impossible to imagine the healthy, sustainable, just and peaceful world of our collective future without the spiritual wisdom and leadership of women. Therefore, we, your grandmothers, mothers, daughters, wives, and sisters, call upon our grandfathers, fathers, husbands, sons, and brothers, and upon each other, and upon all people of faith to alleviate the unwarranted deprivation and suffering of women and girls. <laughs> okay, we don't, we don't know who, but okay, we'll go. <laughs> we are mindful of and grateful for leaders, adherents, and institution of faith, and those interfaith institutions fighting for the dignity, well-being, and equal status and human rights of women around the globe. But more good work remains to be done. We call upon the religions of the world to lead the way in ending violence against women and girls. We call upon faith and interfaith organizations to work collaboratively with institutions and organizations that are working to advance the well-being and rights of women around the globe. Furthermore, we call upon the world's guiding institutions to partner with faith and interfaith organizations working to advance women's well-being and rights. We call upon all religious leaders and adherents to challenge and change harmful teachings and practices that justify discrimination and violence against women and girls. We call upon all religious leaders and adherents to acknowledge and emphasize the positive messages of dignity and equality that the world's faiths share. We call upon all religious leaders and adherents 
to embrace their moral responsibility and collectively commit to ensuring that women are fully and equally involved in decision-making within religions and in every sphere that involves their lives. We call upon the world's religions to honor and uphold the dignity, well-being, and human rights of women and girls. And this should be famous. Okay. <laughs> last period, last period. We commit ourselves to this collective undertaking to heal the heart of our humanity by releasing women, girls, men, and boys from the bondage of gender-based dis discrimination and violence. We do so with hope and with faith in our future. and it gets better. Please welcome from the Immaculate Heart community, Sister Mary Kirchen. I bring greetings from my sister, the author of these words, Michelle de Bexedon, of Immaculate Heart Community in California. And I bring them in memory of the Reverend Dr. Gwen Keyboard, past trustee of the parliament. As we breathe in and breathe out, May the work we do here together enlarge us. May it forge in us all that we need to meet its challenges. May it give us the will to do better than we think we can. May we trust that our work matters. Like plowed earth, we often know ourselves only as raw ground and cannot imagine the ripening of the seed and the flowering to come. So may we learn to trust the process of growth in all of its seasons, because we do not work alone, because we, what we do takes the hands and hearts and minds of all. May our example, our encouragement, and our gratitude awaken gifts in one another, enabling each of us to find joy in what we do. Our work is a blessing and a challenge. May it be worthy of the gifts of our lives. Please welcome Anish Nabe Ojibwe Elder, world-renowned wisdom keeper, humanitarian, activist and author, great-grandmother Mary Lyons, My holy water, coffee. Minogisip, sisters, aunties, grandmothers, all my relations here. First of all, I'd like to recognize the land we're on because we sit among many ancestors, the Anishinaabe, the Ojibwe, the Ho-Chunk, the Potawatomi, the Odawa, and so on. 
So we want to say thanks for sharing this space where we bring all our ancestors to. My name is Nishnibi Ikwe, means second water woman. My colonized name is Mary Lines, and I'm a day one. I sit in the center. I was taught from my grandmother, my, my mother, my grandmother, my great-grandmother, and now I'm very fortunate to sit with my daughter, my granddaughter, and my great-granddaughter. That's our seven generations. I'd like to begin with what is facing us today and a little bit of the prophecy that is coming to light. We're in a time of stillness, a time to reflect the wisdom of the beginning. We are all here in a circle of balance to honor the sacred bundles that have been placed throughout Mother Earth of healing light and truth. Now is the time to focus on the essential truth, giving them power. We are the masters of our own emotions and choices. We all drink from the same well of air, earth, water, and light. Now we sit in a time of debate and argument. Our ancestors foretold a time that would try to erase them and all the life's resources as they knew them. We're in that time. We must fight for our lives, our children's and our grandchildren's future. We must fight for our gardens to be healthy once again. Humankind surrendered to greed that is not a gardening tool of life. We were told of the four snakes that would awaken. One would be invisible and it would conquer mankind. Its name would be alcohol. One would be black, and it would rip through the earth, and its name would be called oil. One would be a mist of wind that would carry a razor-whipping sting as the breath has been tainted with such unthinkable chemicals that travel the earth, and its name would be called pollution. One would have uncontrollable flames that has stride through their parent and its name would be called fire. We must not be fooled, nor tempered by a source that showers a false of ease. We must not allow our ancestors' past to be erased, or we will lose to the criminals that are destroying Earth's gardens. When the rivers within Mother Earth become tainted, all spirits will go to sleep. We must awake to the truth and rise up and fight like we're in our last breath of life. Our grandfathers would tell our community that plenty is a richness for all. Without sharing, we will lose laughter and happiness. Our father would say, when we as original people surrender to a number, we will begin to lose our original commitment to this life. Our grandmothers would say, when you find yourself witnessing our people speaking with a split tongue, they will begin to vanish from our minds. Our mother would say, sometimes you will have to fight in another world that we are not a part of. To walk a mile in our shoes means that we will not put a price on water, fire, air, and earth. Our ancestors spoke of their gardens. They will weaken and we will become hungry. Our ancestors' thirst will become dry and our wells will begin to dry up. Our ancestors' breath will struggle to breathe as the winds will carry diseases. Our ancestors said our fires will rage throughout Mother Earth's homelands and all will feel the blisters of ignorance. The stories of times past, the memories of an organic pathway will only fade if we choose to forget and abandon not only the rights of nature, but the natural law and humanity. We must always hold this memory as it was told to all the tribes of the world. The whispers of our ancestors will echo in the winds and the memory of their teachings will come from protecting 
the rights of nature and the natural law and continue our responsibilities to care for their garden. We all must rise up and speak with our ancestral voice. No, my life is not for sale. No, my life is not for sale. <laughs> Miigwech, I hope you have a beautiful, beautiful rest of the day. Greetings to each one of you participating in this 2023 Parliament of the World's Religions. Thank you very much for having me today in this uh, global dialogue, much needed dialogue to speak about peace, about rights and dignity of humankind and the integrity of nature. I am here today to say a few words about half of the world's population, women and girls. Let me begin by the obvious. When women are treated well and fairly, societies are healthier, more prosperous, more equal, more democratic, and economies work better. And uh, it is not only an issue of having the numbers right, it is an issue of the quality of our societies and political systems. And the paradox is that we have abundant evidence that inclusive laws and policies closing gaps in access to education, jobs, equal pay and representation in decision-making, in politics, in financial services, in peace, in climate, really, really pays off uh, in society. And yet, and yet uh, gender equality has become a political battlefield. In too many parts of the world, being a woman has become a risk, a liability, and not only social and economic rights and, and access to financial services, to health, um, protection against gender-based violence, but it's also on the political and civil rights front. We are witnessing increasing violence against women in politics. And this uh, rollback in women's rights and not only affects women, but has an impact in social cohesion and the quality of our democracies and economies. To address this paradox, we need to mind the gap, as I say. Um, the last uh, gender index report has shown that uh, progress on gender equality has been too slow, too fragile, and too fragmented. A third of countries are either making no progress or moving backwards, and less than a quarter of countries are progressing towards gender equality. And basically, the shorthand of that story is that women are underrepresented in all areas, in science, in jobs, in politics, in leadership, and are overrepresented in all domains of underpaid and unpaid work, especially care work, and in all spaces where important decisions are made. Furthermore, the, the repercussions of these disparities are not merely statistical. Uh, they manifest in real world scenarios. For example, according to UN Women, 130 million girls are deprived of formal education. The aftermath of the pandemic alone deterred 11 million girls from returning to school. These numbers represent untapped potential and uncertain future for these girls. As a recent study showed that an additional year of schooling can boost girls' future earnings up to 20%. And in the labor force, despite women showcasing exemplary skills and competence, women find themselves cornered out of higher positions, constituting a mere 25% in leadership roles. This trend will only widen the existing parity gap. Particularly, this happens in the most impoverished rural areas uh, where women are often digitally marginalized, with over 90% of jobs forecasted to require digital skills. And of course, this divide hampers women workforce participation. 
In according to the Gender Snapshot 2022, 388 million women and girls are living in extreme poverty. This poverty gap is expected to increase by 2030, as women will still be the majority of the world's extreme poor. Additionally, one in three women has suffered from gender-based violence. For some women and girls, their house is the most dangerous place. It is estimated that every 11 minutes, one is killed by someone in her own family. And the international system is not doing better. A recent report from our organization, Global Women Leaders Voices, examining 33 of the world's largest multilateral organizations, revealed that merely a third of these organizations are currently led by women. 13 of these organizations have only had male leaders in their entire history, while five of them have elected a woman director just once in their entire history. Although we have to acknowledge that there has been progress in the past decades, when considering the long arc of history, the journey for women in politics is fraught with peril. An interparliamentary union study found that 81% of female parliamentarians have suffered psychological violence and nearly half have faced brave threats, including threats of death and physical harm. So I think that this scenario is bleak, but we can act. We can make things change. And, and I would like to leave you with four areas of transformation. Number one, affirmative action on legal and policy frameworks to equalize rights. In the 21st century, we still have discriminatory laws and policies that hinder women's access to public life and equal opportunities. We need more women in power at all levels of governance, from city councils to companies, from parliaments to governments. We need more women in the international system. The number two is funding. Investing in women pays off. Women's financial inclusion and gender responsive budgets and investment in public services and infrastructure are highly needed. The number three is women in the world of work. We need to reduce structural barriers in the business ladder. Women are overrepresented in entry level positions and within the lowest paid positions. Women's representation drops from 55% at entry level uh, to 27% at senior leadership positions, uh, especially uh, this becomes worse uh, in STEM positions. Women representation drops from 29% to only 12%. This is terrible. We really need to reshape uh, the care economy as well. The care sector is growing in demand and needs radical overhaul since it is frequently unrecognized, unpaid, and mostly performed by women. In some countries, it goes up to 80%. The remedy to this is visibility and value uh, of the care work. And this should be enhanced. It has to be, the care work has to be well remunerated, professionalized, and defeminized. The other critical issue for economic empowerment is to close the digital gap. We already mentioned that women and girls make up the majority of the 3.9 billion people in rural areas who lack internet access. We need more inclusive digital infrastructure for women and girls. And last but not least, women are agents of peace. No peace process is genuinely inclusive without the voices of women. Women not only have the fundamental right to partake in political decisions at all levels, but also bring about broader perspectives. Our participation in peace building and peacemaking is not just beneficial, but essential. Our inclusion as women, our protection and elevation as agents of peace will pave the way for more peaceful and an inclusive world. 
My final words will be addressed to young women that are the current generation of young professionals, young change makers. We live in a world where peace, security, and a life of dignity and rights are not just ideals, but can be achievable, tangible realities. However, we know and we have to remember that many, too many girls and women are still left behind. Our mission, our imperative should be to ensure that no one is left behind. Each one of you are or should become leaders and defenders of a society that is more equal, more peaceful, more humane, and that's towards nature. Use your voices, your intellect, your passion to push for actions that can transform the lives of women and girls the world, uh, the world over. Surely, we are living in a time of great distress, but also of great opportunity where hope and transformative action should be the path and the engine. By working collectively and ensuring no woman or girl is left behind, we can really forge a better world of unity and diversity. Diversity of culture, of faith, of language. And the time to start shaping a gender equal future starts today. And it starts with you all. I thank you for your attention. Please welcome teacher, speaker, and international consultant on leadership innovation and cultural change, Susan Apodian. Good morning, beloveds. <laughs> my heart feels full as I stand before you, and my deepest gratitude goes to Reverend Phyllis Kurot and Dolly Dastour of the Women's Task Force for inviting me and making it possible for me to be here. I begin by paying homage to the traditional spiritual guardians of the lands, this land that has provided refuge to me, my family, and many others. We are deeply grateful to them, the original caretakers, and thank them for sharing their bounty with us, our families. And I call upon the wisdom keepers in my own Zoroastrian lineage, those who have gone before me and stand behind me. And I acknowledge myself as one among them in a long line of unbroken line of women lineage keepers. We too have survived against all odds. I thank you for welcoming us here in the name of the most ancient of orders. May our thoughts, words, and actions be aligned with the highest good for all human and non-human relatives. On September 16th, one month and one day from today, we mark the one-year anniversary of the death of the 22-year-old Iranian woman, Mahsa Amini, also known as Gina Amini, who died in a hospital in Tehran, Iran, after being arrested by the religious morality police of the Islamic government of Iran. The movement her death sparked in Iran has been captured by the slogan, Zan Zendegi Azadi, woman, life, freedom, and its masculine counterpart, Mad Mihan Abadi, or man, nation, rebuilding. I will be speaking on a panel later this afternoon devoted to this topic. Mr. Khamenei and his lackeys conveniently framed the protests in Iran as an uprising influenced by the West. But this is highly misleading. I'd like to suggest that the Iranian people are reclaiming something from their past. Their embrace of what we consider progressive Western values may be more about a return to indigenous Iranian values and an instinctive drive toward healing and cultural restoration. I am proud to be part of an Iranian lineage that represents these indigenous values, that has for thousands of years recognized and celebrated the value of the feminine and known it to be equal to the masculine, that has upheld the critical importance of freedom of choice, and a lineage that has always honored the natural world as sacred and has given humanity the responsibility to caretake this sacredness. Dina McIntyre, a prominent Zoroastrian elder, has described an earlier time in Iran when Iran was rooted in these traditions. Once upon a time, both women and men served their communities as priests and spiritual counselors, 
could own property and were expected to be able to take up the mantle of political leadership. Surviving texts, for example, instruct Zoroastrians that when it was necessary for a woman priest to travel, duties should be allocated in a balanced manner between married couples so that neither priestly duties nor family responsibilities should suffer. Women also had an independent control over property, even after marriage. Gender equality extended to governance, and one ancient Zoroastrian text prays, may a good ruler, man or woman, thus assume rule over us. Thousands of years ago, it was taken for granted that women could rule in their own right, and they were encouraged to be just rulers. This call of Zan Zendigi Azadi is not just a remembrance of the past, but a call to a future Iran, free from servitude and oppression. One that will bring together the best of the past with the best of today, a place where every religion, every ethnicity, and every gender will be welcome and celebrated. Whatever faith we identify ourselves as being part of, and Zoroastrian texts teach that every young person is entitled to, entitled, um, to choose their own faith after reflection. Iranians can tap into the wellspring of their ancient heritage and live according to its original tenets. Zan Zendigi Azadi, and if I could, I would add a fourth phrase to the trio, and that would be Zamin, or Earth. This call Zan Zendigi Azadi Zamin, woman, life, freedom, earth, is not just for Iranians, but for all of humankind, a call for all of us to reconnect to our ancient knowing. Regardless of what religion we identify with now, all our indigenous wisdom traditions knew of the sacredness of the earth, cherished the preciousness of life, of being birthed into this gloriously beautiful earth, not to mention the menstrual blood that makes it possible. Humans were, in, 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 uh, humans were understood as having innate nobility and dignity and entrusted with the freedom to explore truth in order to spiritually evolve. I want to close with a story. In the spring and summer months near Yazd, Iran, where my mother was born, Iranian Zoroastrians make annual pilgrimage to a shrine atop a mountain, a little oasis in the midst of a stark landscape with a freshwater spring, a cave, and a large tree. For the locals, the stories of the origins of this and other shrines are interwoven with the fate of the last Zoroastrian queen and her daughters during the Arab Islamic conquest of Iran. The story goes that the invaders were in hot pursuit of the royal assembly of the queen and princesses. Things began to look hopeless, and the party decided to separate and ride toward different mountains to allow for some to escape. The queen, Banu in Farsi, rode hard, but she could not outrun her pursuers. About to be abducted, she reached the face of a mountain. Nowhere to go, the Banu called out to God for direction and strength. O oh, Ahura Mazda, wise supreme being. It is said that in her desperation and haste, instead of calling out Yahu, a shortened form of Ahura, she called out Yahu, Ku meaning mountain. Hearing her distress and in compassion, the mountain opened itself to her and she stepped inside, sealed safely within. Many Zoroastrian elders swear that until recently, a part of her garment was still caught in the rocks and could be seen. Centuries passed, Iran was overrun, and the queen encased in the mountain was forgotten. But the story of the Banu did not end there. It is told that one night, an old blind man resting at the side of the mountain had a dream. In it, a queen came to him and bestowed upon him a miracle. And when he awoke, he discovered that she had indeed given him back his sight. In awe and gratitude, he asked what he could do for her in return. She shared her story and instructed him to build a structure there to commemorate the miracle. The shrine he built has become the annual pilgrimage site for Zoroastrian. It is referred to as Chak Chak, an onomatopoeia word which mimics the sound of the drops of spring water as they fall on the rocks. Said to be the tears that the mountain sheds for the fate of the queen, and for Iran. And yet the message is clear. Even in the dark times of social blindness, sight can return. Iran is a traumatized nation freeing itself from internalized oppression. 
The land itself is parched and calling for regeneration. Many of those governing it, like the old blind man, have lost their sight. In their myopia, they wage defensive battles against chimeras and succeed only in amplifying the suffering of a majority of Iranians. But I'd like to humbly declare that we are living now in the age of the return of the hidden Banu. No longer is the queen encased in granite. She's embodied in the increasing numbers of Iranian girls and women, rising up, shedding internal and external veils to reclaim their sovereignty. As the spirit of the hidden Banu reemerges from her mountain shelter, she brings back lost sight. Iranian girls and women, together with their male allies, are leading Iran and inspiring all of us toward a generative cultural renewal necessary to make all of our communities a force of liberation. May it be so. May clear sight return. Thank you so much. Please welcome civil rights attorney and researcher, Cynthia Conti-Cook. I am a civil rights lawyer who studies technology and law, and I'm happy to join you today in my personal capacity on behalf of myself and on behalf of my grandmothers. I have witnessed over two decades of experience how the state patrols and controls people surviving through criminalized economies of self-managed care, surviving circumstances that are often forced upon them through state abandonment and various service deserts. I've witnessed this cause the most amount of harm in black, indigenous, disabled, migrant, gendered, queer, impoverished, and many more othered and historically oppressed communities. And I've witnessed how this harm disrupts how much political power those communities have to fight for their futures. I've also witnessed this up close, the long-term trauma from imprisonment. My father, Jack Cook, was a Catholic worker imprisoned for resisting the Vietnam War. I became a lawyer to better understand how a country could criminalize a pacifist and to understand the constitutional laws that liberated him. But for the past five years, I have specifically studied how digital surveillance technologies have enhanced the state's ability to control many communities. I came here today to speak to the Women's Assembly about surveillance and the soul, to talk to you about a technology that is often called a window into the soul, because I thought peering into the soul was our jurisdiction. I came here today to tell everyone who concerns themselves with the well-being of souls about why we need three intersecting protections in this digital era. First, we need protections for both embodied and digital freedom from corporate and state surveillance. We need protection for political belonging, regardless of criminalized status, and protection from the use of state power to impose moral beliefs on others through laws and digital tools. What is the threat of digital surveillance? Why is digital freedom so intertwined with bodily freedom. It's because the expanding capacity of corporate state surveillance has never been as powerful as it is today. Multiple women in the United States have already had their browsing history, their private text messages, and their credit card transactions used from their digital devices against them as evidence in prosecutions related to the conduct involved with terminating their pregnancies. I have seen police get access to these digital devices, to people's smartphones, through trickery, through asking, can I just see your phone? But people don't understand they have the technology to peer into their soul. That is not just the same as handing me your phone the way I might scroll through it. These are powerful instruments. The police can search text messages with keywords. They can map 
location history onto geographic space. They can connect the dots in your social networks, and they can put all of that in chronological order. More recently, state and corporate collaborations have created new ways for police to access corporate archives of online data that companies extract from our digital bodies as we travel the web. Police get access to our data directly from these corporations without us even being aware of it, let alone consenting to it or being able to challenge it. A Nebraska teenager and her mother were recently convicted after Facebook shared private messages that it collected and archived about the teen's pregnancy. But please let me clarify. When I say that digital surveillance technology is a threat, I want to be clear about what I mean. Last year, I was interviewed by Michael Moore, and someone reacted to the podcast on Twitter by assuring me that he, and he appeared to be a white man, had himself searched online for abortion pills and was not actually arrested the next day, and so I must be hyperbolic and exaggerating. But that is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is happening is that communities already in the crosshairs of system state actors, like police and caseworkers, don't get to select their privacy settings on the level of state control that they are subject to. But we in the political community do, and we must, not only because of how desperately laws are enforced in criminalized communities, but also because of how expediently criminalization creates hierarchies of belonging in political community, which is why, in addition to protections for an integrated bodily and digital freedom, we must also protect political belonging and community regardless of conviction history and regardless of criminalized status. Recall how criminalization has been used historically to, to attack political opponents' voting blocks. Michelle Alexander taught us in New Jim Crow explained thousands of potential voters in black and Latino communities were disenfranchised through drug laws for the past five decades. And obviously, the original Jim Crow laws similarly operated to criminalize blackness and curated the political community. And now, the impact of mass criminalization of communities of reproductive care that followed the Supreme Court decision overturning Roe v. Wade will disproportionately disenfranchise black women whose votes have dramatically changed the outcomes of recent races. And who are more likely to live in a county without access to care? Over 3.7 million women live in a county with no or low access to abortion care or maternal services. Over 1.7 million of those women have access to neither. And we already know that all of those millions of women will go online to fill those gaps. Finally, we must also insist on protections from laws and from digital surveillance that impose the beliefs of some about how to relate to one's body and the universe on others. Because first, they will come for our bodies. But the threat of digital surveillance means that the state and those who covet its omniscient and omnipresent surveillance powers believe they have the tools to target our souls. For example, a software company has sold its surveillance tools to religious organizations to monitor what its members are watching online. This past June, it was revealed that probation officers in Indiana were also forcing people under their supervision to download this technology and monitor their and their family members' devices. It was a condition of their probation, of their freedom. And sure enough, a probation officer has already arrested someone for what they were looking at on their phone through the software. It is a weaponized window into the soul. And this is why I came to speak to you all today, because Christian conservatives are already conceptually buying the bodily control that Silicon Valley is selling. And if we allow state laws to impose others' beliefs on us through coercion and control, through criminalization and digital surveillance, then they will have the power to deny all of us the freedom to self-determination based on our different belief systems. Because fundamental to our soul's freedom to be moral beings and make moral choices is having the choice. Because a choice to say yes to motherhood is what we should celebrate. Today we celebrate Mary, who had to consent to her divine co-creation. We cannot force, through the threat of criminalization, cage, or digital control, Mary's let it be to me. 
her yes had to be totally free. As Denise Levratov wrote in her poem, Annunciation, it was consent that illuminated Mary. Rather than using legal and digital technologies to force how someone makes a moral choice about their body, how can we instead use the collective tools of governance to protect an illuminated experience of consent and to protect the sacred space required by the freedom to choose and by the freedom to roam our bodies, our earth, and our digital spaces freely. Thank you. Please welcome Parlin trustee and founder president of the Green Hope Trust, Ketkash and Basu. the youngest trustee of the Parliament of the World's Religions and a member of its Women's Task Force, I'm delighted to share with you today the one woman song of UN Women. The essence of the song is very beautiful. It tells us that we women and girls in all of our diversity are strong, are beautiful, are smart, and above all, we are one sisterhood, we are one woman. So I would encourage all of you to join me as I sing uh, the chorus towards the end as we shine as one woman.
Thank you. Please welcome members of the Women's Task Force for the Parliament of the World's Religions, Pat Firo and Ann Smith, along with award recipient, Dr. Jean Shinoda Bolin. We can go get it now. Okay. okay, we have three minutes, three minutes for my Million Circle sisters to bring up Jean Shinoda Bolin because it's our time to give all the love, all the praise, all that she has done for us to her. So come on up. And I, I ask you all to stand and to go like, take this from your heart and let's give it to G. Now they're not gonna be able to see you there. <laughs> Jean Shinoda Bolin is, she has, she'll be a plenary speaker. She's written, what, 12, 13 books. She has a new book out called, uh, which is her biography. You'll know all about her. She's famous, she's wonderful, she saved our lives, she's opened our lives, she's opened our hearts. So that's enough. Thank you. <laughs> no, 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 we have a little something for her. <laughs> Hi, Jean. <laughs> we have for your beautiful movement now of the dandelion effect. We have a beautiful dandelion. For your beautiful now movement of the dandelion effect, we have a dandelion necklace for you. Nice. Very <laughs> nice. Thank you. Thank you. Very and a dandelion song that was written by my 90-year-old mother for you. <laughs> well, you probably can read it. I think we have I'll read it. Okay. This is the dandelion song. I, she would say, I, I don't know the tune. I'm sorry. I don't, <laughs> the dandelion song by my 90-year-old mother. When I see a field of green, when I see a field of green, of golden dandelions, I get a thrill. I always will. I know f most folks treat them with disdain. Um, I'm sorry, I need my glasses. <laughs> um, I know most folks treat them with disdain, but I love them so, maybe I'm insane. Perhaps in spring, the greens you've tried, or in summer, blossoms fried. Then wine in fall, dad loved it best of all. So if you see this blossom free, then let it be, just let it be. We have buttons, get lots of buttons. Here's the buttons are gorgeous and they have the website of the Million Circle and Green Tent Circle. Please welcome founding executive director of Faith in Public Life, Reverend Jennifer Butler.
Hello, everyone. What a pleasure to be in this space with this great energy and support. I have spent a lifetime countering the Christian rights by mobilizing faith coalitions centered in human dignity. I stepped enthusiastically into my first job in ministry as the Presbyterian Church representative to the United Nations, charged with the glorious mission of advancing women's rights, only to see the Christian right gut my denomination's programs at my very first General Assembly. As surely as night follows day, the following year in 2000, I encountered them at a United Nations gathering. It was a gathering to review the Beijing Platform for Action from the Fourth World Conference on Women. They used the same strategies they had used in my denominational gathering, talking points full of disinformation, Trojan horse tactics, flooding the assembly with delegates. I wrote a book to expose this Christian right effort to export the culture wars around the world, and I organized people of faith to resist by amplifying religious arguments for women's rights, first at the UN and then domestically by founding and leading faith in public life. Yet today, sadly, the Christian right in the U.S. has become a full-blown global Christian nationalist movement lining up behind autocratic leaders to advance a white supremacist patriarchal and homophobic agenda. And the global Christian right has polarized the world along the lines of a culture war, seeking to establish a patriarchal xenophobic autocracies all throughout the world, just as my book unfortunately predicted. Today, they're rapidly passing legislation that undermines women's LGBTQ and children's rights in Africa Latin America, Western and Eastern Europe, they're demonizing the very idea of democracy and human rights, saying it is somehow anti-religious, while they build connections to autocrats like Vladimir Putin and Viktor Orban, who host and fund their movements. Other forms of religious nationalism are on the rise as well. Autocrats are weaponizing religion to amass power and maintain control from Russian Orthodox nationalism to Catholic nationalism in Hungary and Poland, to Hindutva in India, to Jewish nationalism manifesting in Israel's new ruling coalition, to evangelical and Pentecostal forms of religious nationalism in the US and Brazil. Religion is being manipulated to give moral sanction to hideous acts of violence that run contrary to moral teachings and women's and LGBTQ and religious and migrant right rights are the first to go, but they will come for us all. And if no one speaks against them, our voices, specifically our faith voices, if they are not heard above the toxic den of autocratic disinformation, these lies will take hold. People ask how I have hope to do the work that I do. Let me tell you why I have hope. My hope was born in partnership with Muslim women who worked with me at the UN to sponsor an event on religious extremism at a time when I had begun to doubt my own faith and my own sense of call to ministry. Midway through that event, the Saudi Arabian security guards burst into the room with the ambassador. The speaker faltered and I held my breath. The guards were clearly attempting to physically intimidate the speakers but the global community of women rose to their feet to applaud the women, and the shaken speaker was able to continue her presentation, and the women stayed to their feet and physically cloaked and blocked the security guards. It was the courage of the Muslim women that inspired me not only to claim my faith on my own terms, but to get ordained with the goal of bringing a feminist, theological, liberationist theology to a world of injustice. 
For the sake of the world and for the sake of my own spiritual well-being, I could not let Christian extremists hijack my faith. I learned to make an explicit argument from my faith for the human rights of all while respecting the guardrails of secular democracy and doing this work in solidarity with people of all faith and those of a secular moral belief system. And while many at the time were worried that this would lead to a compromise in the separation of church and state, it became clear that it was a faith voice that would save democracy and human rights. In leading faith in public life, I got to be inspired every day to see faith leaders step forward to reclaim their voices. And I will never forget joining a protest outside the U.S. Supreme Court to protest the Dobbs decision, which ended federal protections to abortion access. I stood alongside even pro-life religious colleagues who also opposed criminalization of abortion in favor of supporting women with options. Through diver though diverse in our perspectives, pro-life and pro-choice, we knew the Dobbs decision was not about abortion. It was about patriarchy. It was nothing to do with religious freedom and everything to do with controlling women. As I began to speak, the activists on the other side began to shout me down. They began to get in our faces, breaking the COVID and protest regulations. A man with a megaphone was yelling straight into our speaking space. As I spoke, I could not even hear my own voice. And for a moment, I faltered. Was it worth it to continue? I saw that my staff were feeling terrified. In front of me, though, in the crowd, I saw an older woman, a complete stranger. She locked eyes with me, calm, fierce, solid, protective, and I spoke to her. I was able to continue, and so were the other women. We are up against a lot, but we women have power in our solidarity and diversity, even when facing a juggernaut. In 2018, I joined a group called Moms Rising on Capitol Hill in Washington. We were there to witness Homeland Security Secretary Kirsten Nielsen testify before Congress on the Trump administration's child separation policy. Moms Rising had made little baby onesies with the names of children that, were, that had died, in fact, were killed by neglect in detention centers. As I waited to go into the hearing, the Capitol Police Chief singled me out by name. I didn't know him, but he sure knew who I was quite possibly from a mugshot, because I had been arrested living, leading civil disobedience during the uprising to protect the Affordable Care Act. He had a cell phone to his ear and he looked worried. He removed the phone from his ear and he said to me, I'm being told that if you hold up that onesie in this hearing, you will be arrested. Imagine that the power of a onesie to drive fear into the hearts of member of Congress. Sometimes, my friends, we don't even know the power that we have. Our creativity and moral authority as women is critical to countering tyranny. Even when we're up against Goliath, our ability to be bold, to tell things as they are, as life givers and as moral leaders will bring autocrats down. And that is what we're doing here this week, building solidarity, forging broad coalitions, reclaiming our faith for justice, grounding in our leadership as women, keeping the true vision of our faiths, human dignity, alive now and for future generations. Tyrants will try to convince us that our dream of dignity for all is impossible, unrealistic, or even undesirable. But hope is born in our ability to imagine God's vision of human dignity for all becoming a reality. And that is why we're here in Chicago. As long as we continue to amplify that vision, then hope will power us and future generations to make it so. Thank you. Please welcome Vice President at the Anti-Defamation League, Yao Eisenstein.
Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, and fellow advocates for a safer, more just world. Today, I stand before you not only as an advocate, but as someone who has witnessed firsthand the devastating impacts of hate, harassment, and extremism in both our online and offline worlds. In my current role leading the Center for Tech and Society at the Anti-Defamation League, I work to end the proliferation of hate, harassment, and extremism online, as well as to hold both tech companies and the perpetrators of online hate accountable for their actions. <laughs> Despite all the great things that technology has provided the world, I have seen the dark underbelly of our online ecosystem and it's at time corrosive effects on discourse and democracy. After spending nearly two decades dedicated to protecting national security, both at home and abroad, I began fearing that the biggest threat to American democracy was actually the breakdown in our own discourse, the toxic, effective polarization that was pitting us against our neighbors. I started ringing the alarm bells publicly back in 2015 and digging deeper into how social media was fueling this threat. Ultimately, that led me to working at Facebook, where I was tasked with protecting the integrity of elections around the world. I witnessed the alarming proliferation of disinformation campaigns designed to deceive and manipulate voters. These campaigns exploited existing fault lines in society stoking hatred and division. And they used the very tools that Facebook and other social media companies offered to accomplish these goals. Unsurprisingly, women in particular were often targeted with gender-based disinformation and toxic content, aimed at undermining their credibility and suppressing their voices. Time and again, I raised these concerns internally at Facebook. And time and again, they overlooked the urgency of these threats. So I knew it was my duty to raise the alarm, and I did. Politically stoked offline violence was inevitable if nothing changed, and what I warned could eventually happen did on January 6th, when an insurrection planned in open, largely on Facebook, struck our na nation's capital. My worst case scenario came true. So since leaving Facebook in 2018, I have dug much deeper into the roles that social media and other tech companies play in our lives. At ADL, I am laser focused on ending the proliferation of anti-Semitism and all forms of hate and harassment online. <laughs> you see, anti-Semitism, much like misogyny, is a canary in the coal mine. Where we see a rise in anti-Semitism, in misogyny, in these kinds of hate, we know violence against other groups is not far behind. Unfortunately, as our research at ADL proves, online abuse continues at ramp rampant levels. And sadly, it is no surprise that female politicians, activists, and journalists bear the brunt of this abuse. Women brave enough to enter the political arena and fight for change are subjected to severe online attacks and offline. For women of color and religious minorities, these attacks are only compounded. Relentless vitriol silences women. It impacts their ability to fully participate in society. It discourages aspiring female leaders from entering politics. It perpetuates the underrepresentation of women in positions of power. As a Jewish woman with a public voice, I have just come to expect harassment whenever I log on to social media. I have long been a target for both those who I have criticized and for an army of online trolls. They work to discredit and silence my voice. And I admit, in part, they have succeeded. I have found myself self-censoring more than once, hesitating to enter certain public conversations. That, after all, is what they are hoping to do, to silence us. Sadly, my experience is not unique. According to my team's annual online hate and harassment survey, year after year, women report high rates of online hate and harassment. In the last 12 months alone, 
Roughly one in three women reported identity-based online harassment. Nearly one in five reported severe harassment, such as physical threats, stalking, doxing. Our 2023 findings verify that religious minorities, as well as LGBTQ plus people and women, continue to face a disproportionate level of online hate. And we know that platforms are not adequately supporting targets. For example, our latest data revealed that over a 12 month period, nearly 40% of respondents received physical threats on social media. But when they reported these threats, more than one third of the time, platforms took no action. They didn't delete the content. They didn't suspend the violating user. These targets were left without the support they deserve. The consequences of this relentless harassment and abuse are far reaching, even beyond the personal toll it takes on victims. When marginalized voices are targeted and silenced online and offline, our collective democratic discourse and societal advancements suffer. Women's unique perspectives, insights, and lived experiences are vital for shaping inclusive policies and advancing societal progress. The absence of these voices perpetuates systemic biases and inequalities, hindering our collective ability to address pressing challenges. This is why I keep fighting. And this is why my team continues to insist that both the tech industry and our governments have roles to play in reversing this course and creating a healthier online ecosystem that both protects people and helps foster more robust and thriving democracies. In fact, I will be speaking later on today at 5 p.m. with another one of my colleagues where we will go into more detail on a panel called How Tech Advances are fueling online hate. So I hope you will join us there. Social media companies tell us that harassment is just a necessary cost of doing business. We need to put up with it in order to protect free speech. But we do not need to choose between protecting free speech and protecting targets from harm. Changing the incentive structures for social media companies to do business having more information about the inner workings of platform systems and increasing protections for targets of hate can change the game. There isn't one single fix. It isn't simple, but it is possible. Social media executives and engineers can and should design their platforms and content policies differently, prioritizing safety and community over engagement and profit. We as advocates must also choose to use our voices and power to shine a light on these issues and to demand the changes needed to foster a safer, more equitable digital world. Women, people of color, LGBTQ plus people and religious minorities know when something will be dangerous for us. We are experts on the hate directed at us. Our warnings to social media companies and government must be taken seriously. So I urge you to make your voices heard and to push for all of us to collaborate from technology companies to policymakers, educators to civil society. We can create inclusive spaces that amplify the voices of women in underrepresented groups. And we must work collectively to forge a safer, more inclusive online ecosystem. By doing so, we can reclaim the true potential of technology and build a world where equality, respect, and the free exchange of ideas can flourish. A safer, more equitable online system is possible. We just need to fight for it. Thank you.
Please welcome flamenco dancer and choreographer, Omai Ra Amaya.
Please welcome President of the American Muslim and Multi-Faith Women's Empowerment Council, Agnila Ali. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. Hello to all of you, sisters and brothers. What a beautiful gathering this is and how honored I am to be here to speak to all of you. My sisters, religion is like fire. It can be used for good or it can be used for bad. Depends on who wields it and what they use it for. It gives warmth and sustenance, transforming raw materials into powerful forces. But it can also burn and it can also destroy, raging uncontrolled, with devastating results. For women, the fiery duality of religion is even more intense. It can be an unparalleled source of empowerment and growth, or it can be a deadly force of subjugation and repression. For Muslim women like me, the fire of faith is particularly intense, as I have repeatedly observed firsthand. I wish to speak today about how Muslim women can harness and are harnessing religion for good despite the many risks that surround us. I was born in Pakistan. My grandmother, who was born in India more than a century ago, led the movement for Pakistan. She fought against the British, became the first elected parliamentarian in India. My father, he was a leader and he joined her. After Pakistan was made, they together fought for women, girls, and the rights of minorities in Pakistan. My grandmother led scores of women and inspired generations to lead. My father told me when I was getting married, he said, marriage is in blind subservience to man. Well. My father had written a book on the life of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and seven million copies had been distributed around the world. He emphasized the commitment in his book, he emphasized the commitment of Prophet of Islam to women, women's empowerment. And therefore, he raised me to be an independent woman, to succeed on my own, to be equal to men and never to let gender rules hold me back. Now, whether his interpretations were correct or not, the evidence, my brothers and sisters, is right in front of you. America is a great country to be a Muslim in, but we can't take these freedoms for granted. And therefore, we founded AMWEC, American Muslim Multi-Faith Women's Empowerment Council. Why? Because we wanted to give Muslim women a platform to protect their rights and build interfaith bridges 
So let me tell you what AMWEX stands for. Our manifesto reads, as maternal pillars of the community, American Muslim women have a uniquely powerful leadership responsibility. Yes, we respect ourselves and we hold, uphold high standards of ethical conduct. Yes, we face reality very honestly. We have so much to be proud of in our faith tradition and yet much to be concerned about in our global community. Our founding prophet, peace be upon him, brought a dynamic message of overcoming stagnation and ignorance, but today many invoke his name to repress, regress, and radicalize. We, as Muslim women, stand for truth. We cannot sit by silently and passively. We enjoy the freedom to stand for justice, even in the face of intimidation. We must confront bigotry, both when it comes from our neighbors and when it comes from within our own community. And we cannot let shame prevent us from being brave and speaking the truth. We bring Americans together. Muslim women can lead a new movement for empowerment and tolerance, one that is going to inspire the support of America, of faiths, of races and all genders and none. Together, we can uphold the legacy of our beautiful faith and build the future for all Americans and indeed our world. It's one thing to say these strong words, I tell you, but it's often a challenge to put them into action. Let me share a few stories. Once I was giving a presentation on women's rights in Islam to a room full of US law enforcement officials and prosecutors and top leaders. After my presentation, an Iraqi gentleman stood up and he questioned me in front of the entire room. How can you be a Muslim leader when you don't wear a hijab? He shamed me. How would you respond to that question? For me, it was a defining moment. Having my identity, my faith, and my womanhood dismissed right in front of a room full of national leaders. Here's how I answered him. Sir, I come from a Muslim majority country that has twice elected a woman, female prime minister, Benazir Bhutto, and she did not wear a hijab. She was a leader. Another time, after the San Bernardino mass shooting, Islamist terrorist, a woman from Pakistan who was a part of that. My community was very, very shocked. A group of leaders from my organization began working with law enforcement and building bridges to ensure that we are not targeted. So these women wanted to be responsible citizens during a time of crisis, indeed, New York Times sent a journalist to cover our efforts, but when we all entered the mosque, the local mosque, with this journalist who was a female, the male mosque leaders turned around and said, sisters, over there. They ordered us to go in the kitchen. <laughs> what would you do? That was patronizing us. They wanted to cut us out of an adult conversation but we refuse to be banished to the kitchen. As you heard from my sister from ADL, we endure offensive comments, but in the end, they're only words. As we gather here, I want you to think of all the Muslim women on the front lines around the world who have risked their lives to stand up for basic equality and have often paid the price. Let's recall Masa Amini, a young girl from Iran, and may God grant her a place in the heavens. She was murdered for showing too much hair. She is one of thousands of women taking a stand for what they believe is right, for their daughters and their granddaughters. Here in the US and in the West, there are occasional brutal honor killings. But the larger challenge Muslim women leaders face is sexual harassment. 
belittlement and tokenization. I think of a young Muslim civil rights leader who should be watching me. Here in the US, a hijab-wearing activist who devoted herself to a major Muslim civil rights organization here in the US, only to find herself asked to perform sexual favors by the organization's leader. When she refused, the blowback, brothers and sisters, was terrible. It was intense. She found herself threatened, bullied, and sued into silence. Even though she fought back and achieved justice, the price was intense, and she struggles even now to rebuild her life. Her life destroyed by vindictive men. In the face of these challenges, we need action. So let me briefly outline an agenda for all of us to empower Muslim and other women. An agenda that we can all adapt. Never, ever question a woman's ability to serve as a leader. And never subject her to superficial litmus tests on how she dresses. Instead, make sure that women of merit have equal ability to serve in leadership roles in all communities. Be wary of partnering with organizations whose top leaders have harassed and belittled women. If an organization has been dominated by a handful of men, be suspicious and don't fall, a, fall for a few token women leaders in that organization. Look for genuine diversity and a proven track record of empowerment through programs, not just empty rhetoric. Embrace genuine diversity. We don't all have to agree on everything. We have different interpretations of verses, surahs, holy books. We have different opinions. We have different histories and diverse cultures. Let's appreciate the power of difference and the need to respect a range of views informed by a beautiful faith traditions. Despite all the challenges we leaders, women leaders face, we must never give in to the allure of victimhood. We are survivors, as you see me in front of you. We are not victims. We hold the keys to improving our own situation and we can lament abuse without wallowing in it. We are upstanders not bystanders. If you see an emerging woman leader struggling to achieve recognition in the face of demeaning and disempowering behavior, speak up for them, stand with them. Sisterhood and brotherhood in the course of Muslim women's empowerment is needed now more than ever before. Be bold, my sisters and brothers, unafraid to work outside the box. Last year, we, and my, some of my sisters are here, we led two delegations of Muslim Americans to Israel. Whoa. We even met with the president of Israel, President Herzog, to whom I gave a copy of my father's book on the Prophet of Islam, peace be upon him, and on the building of Pakistan. But it was not easy to do this. It was outside the box thinking. And it wasn't easy for all the participants to do this. However, it transformed our lives and our views, indeed, despite some extremists complaining about our trip and even issuing fatwas, death threats against me. I realized that life is not a zero-sum game. There are creative solutions to conflicts, and sometimes grassroots actors like you and me can break where political leaders fail. Muslim women have the ability to envision and lead solutions to some of the world's most pressing challenges. Let us resolve to harness the fire of faith for empowering ends. I stand before you as thousands of Muslim women who are committed to achieving a new era of empowerment. We are inspired by our past. We are not prisoners of it. We love our faith which we believe is fundamentally about unleashing human potential, not constraining it. We are not blind to the darkness that impacts so many of our sisters, as in Afghanistan, but we remain focused on moving towards the light 
at the end of the tunnel. Our faith gives us hope. Our maternal ancestors give us inspiration. And our daughters and granddaughters remind us that we have a responsibility to be bold, to forge a better future for them. So join me, my brothers and sisters, in harnessing the warm fire of faith to light the way forward. Thank you for your solidarity and thank you to these amazing women leaders of Parliament of World Religions. Shukriya. Please welcome the Global Chair at the United Religions Initiative, Preeta Bonsal. Hello, dear sisters and brothers. It is truly a joy and a privilege for me to be among you, who are luminaries and apostles of peace from around the world. This week's gathering at its core is about celebrating our many ways of addressing the mysteries of life, of nature, and of the universe. This week we have in front of us and before us a diverse group that across culture and tradition recognizes both the power and the limits of the human mind. We are people seeking through spiritual and religious traditions to cultivate the heart's intelligence and other forms of the deeper intelligence. This is a gathering for those who have the humility and wisdom to embrace that among all beings on this earth, human beings are the youngest. And that among all cultures, Western culture is the youngest. So as we stand on a stage in front of a banner and in, on a program that speaks of defending freedom and human rights, let us recall that freedom is ultimately an inside job, not dependent on a relatively adolescent Western legal framework alone. While outer forms such as the rights paradigm are worth defending, let's not cling too tightly to the world of form as we know it, much less on the act of defending. Instead, may we go deeper and seek to draw upon the formless within each of our traditions to attune to the fissures, the fault lines, the cracks, and the openings, the seismic shifts and endings that are occurring so that we may wisely trust and be midwives for what is wanting to be born. As Brother Bio Akumalafi reminds us, wisdom is what remains when we've come to the end of everything we know. Wisdom is what remains when we've come to the end of everything that we know. In so many of our world's traditions, there's a story told about a man looking for lost trees under a street lamp. When a constable comes to help him unsuccessfully, he finally asks the man, where exactly did you drop the keys? And the man responds, across the street over there. Bewildered, the constable asks, so why exactly are we looking over here? And the man responds, because I can't see over, the, over there. The light is much better over here. This well-known parable in so many of its forms throughout our traditions illustrates our human tendency to look only where the artificial light has been placed, even when we know that the answers to the hardest questions require us to look in the dark, to sit still and hear the sound of the genuine within us when we've come to the end of everything that we think we know. So this might seem like a little bit of an unlikely message coming from someone like me who's a former constitutional lawyer, a senior government official, a US diplomat, who spent 30 years 
working at the intersection of human rights, democracy, and civil rights, and who helped advise on the drafting of the Afghan and Iraqi constitutions to protect the rights of women and religious freedom. After, after a career seeking to uphold and strengthen the best of our social and institutional forms, I came to recognize, at least for me, after some life-shaking spiritual experiences more than a decade ago, that neither I nor we collectively can think or plan our way out of the multiple crises we are facing today using the same language and frameworks that got us here. As our sister Audre Lord said, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. We, we must instead sit still, untangle the knots, and seek the deeper intelligence of the divinely human heart over the cleverness of our minds. Never has this need to tap into deeper intelligence been more important than now in an era of exponentially intelligent machines. At a time so, of so much turbulence in our world, from the climate crisis, the crisis of democracy among a rising tide of authoritarianism, and the crisis of humanity itself in the face of AI, it is the people here in this room and in this gathering who are engaged in daily practices of spirit, body, and nature, who will help us jump collectively into the hyperspace of a new capacity and consciousness. And it will only be when we today surrender and stop defending or fighting for what, what is a piece of the pie in our past systems. Because wisdom is what remains when we've come to the end of everything we know. So let us embrace this time of multiple looming crises and be prepared to create rather than defend during this historical inflection point. Disruptions in our social systems, after all, follow and lag shifts in our technology and scientific understandings by at least a half century. The invention of the printing press in the 15th century gave rise to the Protestant Reformation and the decline of the Holy Roman Empire and the rise of the nation state. The invention of the steam engine in the 1700s led to factories, urbanization, and the outpouring of moral and political philosophy from Adam Smith to Rousseau and Mill that created the foundations for the modern state and our market economy. The shift from Newtonian to quantum physics, the digital revolution and the, of the past decades, and the rise of machine intelligence is now transforming exponentially our social, governing, and economic systems. We have a choice. We can either curse the darkness and go into defensive mode, or we can light a small candle and discern and collectively sense our way one step at a time toward building a new inclusive model that will make the old one obsolete. Much as Eleanor Roosevelt did with, with the UN Declaration of Human Rights nearly a century ago. So let us not, as women, divert from our life-affirming creative focus now, even as we defend what may be shifting or passing. Let's double down on our deeper forms of heart and divine intelligence. The world doesn't need bigger and better tools of the old. We, need, we don't need new nonprofits, new strategies, or big tactics. What we need are small groups of people who are waking up and coming alive in community with one another. We simply can't turn away from our commitment to the awakening of the divine feminine energy and run back to the master's house and the master's power tools. We owe this to our mothers and grandmothers and great-grandmothers. Perhaps we're on day 38 of our 40 days in the desert. Who knows? Regardless, let's not turn back. 
this panel asks of us, where are the women? We are here waking up and helping the world wake up through our connection to the formless and our steadfast recognition of where true power lies. I have worked in the White House and the Supreme Court and the UN, and I can tell you power lies here in this group of women, in small groups of women coming together, coming alive, and waking up. So let's pause and take just a moment to reach for the sacred within us so we may connect with ourselves and one another this week from the deeper place. And let's trust in what is wanting to be birthed through us because wisdom is what remains when we've come to the end of everything we know. What an incredible joy it is to be in community with each of you toward an emergent model of life-affirming freedom through deep discernment and divine feminine wisdom in action. Let's, let's defend our human rights and let's also create what is coming in the future. Thank you so much. Please welcome transformative leader and change maker, Aina Nia Ayodeli. Greetings, my relations. Did I hear you? Greetings, give me some energy. <laughs> jumbo, jumbo, jumbo. I am Ainania Ayodele Ajwa Ifayemi, which means Ainania, she who has purpose. Ayodele, joy has come home. Ajwa, because I was born on a Monday. And Ifayemi, Ifa befits her. Ifa is my African tradition that I follow. I acknowledge my ancestors of African descent, for whom I continue this work of spiritual liberation activism for humanity and especially for black people, womankind, and all those who continue to be most oppressed and dehumanized. Today, I honor my ancestors. You will see them behind me. Our ancestors, specifically women ancestors, who fought hard and tirelessly for our liberation. And I want to call their names. If we had time, I would call all their names, but I want you to acknowledge them. All the women who fought behind the men's who, men who were never named, I want you to acknowledge them. On every continent, we can see the expressions of blatant hate and movements against human rights which is directly and indirectly dehumanizing women and girls. Authoritarians are becoming brusher and more overt in their abuse across the globe. Democracy is being threatened globally. We're experiencing real danger more than ever as spiritual trailblazers, activists, and religious leaders we have a responsibility to be bodacious, vigilant, consistent in our committed actions for liberation and democracy. This call to conscience, defending freedom and human rights is an urgent call. Each of us who lead spiritual communities and faith organizations must make it our business to challenge the global threat of autocracy and acts of neocolonialism in case we didn't realize that it's here and very much at our doorstep. There are two points that I wish to highlight in this short moment. First, the micro actions of daily political decisions within our systems that are threatening democracy, human rights, and justice. In Canada where I live, one could argue that even our most conservative governments are not a threat to democracy. 
Yet, we are seeing very direct policy changes further oppressing those who are most marginalized. Let me give you a couple of examples. For instance, we have a family child benefits policy, which is one of the best policies we have in Canada. And under the current government administration, many women and children are now excluded from basic supports. Ontario Bill 23 was enacted late last year and now removes municipal government's ability to mandate much needed affordable housing and green spaces as developers gentrify and redevelop to build condos and overpriced market rent units. While activists across Canada continue to bring light to the violence against women, girls, and 2SLGBTQ peoples, only recently the government of Manitoba publicly refused to search the landmines for remains of two indigenous women bodies left in the dumpsters like unused garbage. We know the capitalism, that capitalism is working hand in hand with autocracy, patriarchy, and overall colonialism for policies that continue to destroy the souls and crush the dreams of human lives by the very people who are meant to govern them. So, as we focus, my relations, as we focus on the macro policies and actions, let's pay very close attention and bring intentional voice to these micro impacts on the ground. For we know that any society that invisibilizes those most marginalized is a society that dismantles democracy gradually, deliberately, and effectively. Secondly, as spiritual feminist activists and our men who are allies, as we work together, we must also acknowledge that intersectionality matters in empowering, empowering for liberation and democracy. According to US Stats 2022, the de gender gap in pay is worsening. I'm sure that COVID had something to do with that. And of course, women are getting the brunt of it as we do in these situations. Women in general earned 82% to every dollar earned by their male counterpart. However, that is compounded when you consider intersectional identities. In 2022, black women earned 70 cents to the dollar, Hispanic women 65 cents to every dollar earned by their white male counterparts. As you can well imagine, that wage gap widens for women who are black, indigenous, racialized, women with disabilities, and the list goes on. Intersectionality matters. Canadian stats recently showed homelessness among women is increasing. It's about 34% right now of the population of homelessness in Canada. Indigenous and sexual minority women are highly overrepresented in these numbers, many with intersectional identities, including black women and women living with disabilities. As we work together for the common outcome of defending freedom and human rights with a focus on women and girls, we must also recognize that our experiences of patriarchy and colonization are not the same. And it is in honoring the, our various intersectional identities which shape our experiences and strengthen this cause. As Audre Lorde declares, one of my favorites, I am not free while any woman is unfree, even when her shackles are different from my own. So in closing, my colleagues, my friends, my relations, community, we do not have the luxury of separating church from state. 
and being in the world, but not of the world. We cannot remove ourselves from neither the micro or macro actions of those writing policies and making decisions for people's lives. We are in a state of emergency to disrupt the dismantling of democracy and the uprising of neocolonialism and autocracy across the globe. On April 16, 1963, in the midst of the civil rights movement, while in Birmingham jail, Dr. Martin Luther King wrote, and I quote, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Never again can we afford to live with the narrow provincial outside agitator idea, end quote. The threat to justice is on our doorstep. The threat to injustice is at, the threat to justice is at my doorstep. The threat to justice is at your doorstep. It's at our doorsteps. So let's make a daily commitment to decolonize and to shift our own autocratic gaze in our own ways. Every day I ask myself, Ainania, how are you still acting in colonized ways? And we need to ask ourselves because it begins with us. We must move away from the autocratic gaze. We must move away from the colonized ways of being in our own way so that we can employ an intersectional lens to, your, to our calling as spiritual and faith leaders. Be courageous. Be courageous enough to make visible those most marginalized and oppressed. That you may create sustained transformation in your local and global environments. Remember your power to lead. Remember your power to disrupt. Remember your power for change. Remember our collective power. You saw our march this morning and how the energy was so powerful when we get together as women. So remember your power because together we can disrupt injustice everywhere. Thank you for being with me today. Thank you, everybody. Please come back at 1 o'clock for our crisis plenary, and please join us in our, our traditional dance, Break the Chains. If the volunteers would please come up. Whoever wants to dance on stage, please come up. Whoever wants to dance in the aisles, please get up. And if the, yeah, if the AV team will bring up the music. Music, 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 music please. We'll see you at 1.